Hello, my name's Tom and welcome to a slightly belated, later than usual, F1 fantasy video. We're going to France. We're in France already. It's Saturday, the deadline's today. I need to record this and get it uploaded, otherwise no one's even going to see it. So let's get on with it. Um, please subscribe if you're not already subscribed and please, if you can be bothered to click the like button, then do so because, you know, it makes a difference to me. So thank you very much if you do that. Um, it's a bit of a headache, to be honest. It's a bit of a headache going into France because there's so much going on. We've got, you know... Red Bull slightly underperforming. We've got Carlos signs of his grid penalty potentially starting at the back of the grid. As of the, as of the time of recording this video, we don't actually know for sure if he's starting at the back of the grid, but it looks very likely that he'll be starting at the back of the grid. So that's going to impact, obviously, our decision making. The team I've got at the moment on, on my screen is what I had from Austria, you know, with the Mega Driver on Verstappen. There is a temptation to just kind of leave it as it is, and I'm going to be discuss, discussing that in just a second. I'm going to very briefly look at FP1, FP2 results. <clears throat> Just in case you guys haven't seen it yourself, I'm sure most of you would have looked already, but here we are anyway. If you've not had a chance to look at FP1 and FP2, these are the results. I'm not going to run through it in any great detail. I want to get on with the actual team selection, to be honest, but these results are important to bear in mind. Just very briefly, Ferraris look good. <laughs> um, Red Bulls look kind of okay. Mercedes not quite as impressive as I was expecting. Gasly, Norris looking very good for that that sort of mid-priced uh, mid-priced asset in fantasy this week uh Perez struggling slightly Albon impressing and then you know Albon Albon Albon's a, a tricky one but yeah Albon in particular in FP1 obviously impressing and we have to bear in mind also Latifi's got that upgrade on the Williams as well so uh, that's obviously going to serve him really well as he comes in in P20 and P20 but yeah <laughs> just joking sorry Latifi if you if you ever randomly watch this video I, I I'm, I'm not I'm not being mean I promise um, but anyway then so from down from P10 downwards like I said the Alpine's kind of disappointing like kind of very surprising but also just disappointing I feel let down by these Alpines man but obviously we've got FP3 to come it is their home race I don't think the home race thing has too much of an impact but it should you know it should get some extra support and the support I think can can have a small impact it's very small but it wouldn't really factor into my decision making to be honest um, but yeah, and then we've got like the, other, the likes of Alfa Romeo, just not not looking exciting, like the likes of Bottas, uh, who is obviously a popular pick, not looking particularly exciting, however, Bottas does have a tendency to just randomly score like 20 points, even when he looks rubbish, so I wouldn't rule out Bottas either, even though he doesn't really feature, I don't think he's going to feature in my team this week, but if you pick him, I think you're probably going to end up with like 15, 20 points, like whatever, like Bottas just keeps providing, but anyway, that's a quick rundown of FP1, FP2, let's get into the meaty, nitty, gritty, of team selection because this is a tough one this week so this is my team at the moment this is um i haven't made any substitutions and there is a, just a temptation to kind of just leave it i've got literally no money in the bank so i can't really you know if i can't really like for example upgrade magnuson to schumacher or latifi to albon or whatever um a temptation if i had the budget for example would be to move alonso to gasly because gasly's looking really strong um but yeah there is a temptation to just do nothing basically um if I just undo that, put Alonso back in, there is a temptation to just leave it like that because I think this team could could potentially do well. With Red Bull, although Perez doesn't look great, I anticipate Red Bull to close the gap through FP3 and then into qualifying with a few setup changes. Um, I do think Perez should be doing much better than what he's doing, and I think he probably will. But even if he doesn't, say Perez has a poor qualifying, like, even if he doesn't even make Q3 for some crazy reason, like imagine he like, qualifies P11, P12 or something. The race pace in that Red Bull is going to shoot him through like easy overtake points. He should be, he should still be competing in that sort of P3 to P5 sort of area. And therefore, I do think that Perez is still a good shout. And therefore, Red Bull themselves are a good shout. Um, Carlos Sainz is a big talking point at the moment. Uh, for off the track stuff, don't know what's going on there, but we're more focused on about the on the track stuff. Carlos Sainz is. He's got this grid penalty confirmed at the, as of the time of recording this as 10 places, but it could be at the back of the grid, and I think he probably will be from the back of the grid. It's almost like if he doesn't take a new engine now, then it's going to happen at some point in the, in the, later on in the season, so you might as well, if you've already got that 10 place grid penalty, just take just go to the back. So I anticipate he's going to be at the back of the grid. How does that impact color signs? How does that impact Ferrari? Obviously, it's not great because it means there's chances of getting a podium where the main points are is severely limited it's still possible but it's severely limited it's less likely if you start at the back of the grid no one else is at the back of the grid so almost certainly Carlos Sainz won't even bother taking part in qualifying I would imagine 
Um, <clears throat> that means, you know, from qualifying, zero points. It does mean he'll gonna, he's going to get those 10 points gained from positions gained because he's almost certainly, barring a DNF, going to get the 10 points from going at the back. He's going to fly through all the slower cars. He'll get those overtake points, capped off at 10 points. But regardless, if he doesn't take part in quality, he's basically effectively starting with 10 points just from overtakes. Um... I don't think he's going to like catch the likes of Verstappen and Clerk. Probably won't start pe uh, catch Perez. The Mercedes, they may have the pace. They, Mercedes always like do better in race pace than they do in practice sessions and qualifying. The race pace in that Mercedes is definitely a bit of a dark horse. And will Carlos Sainz catch them? Possibly. So I think sort of most likely scenario for Carlos Sainz, if, if it's a clean race, is he's going to get back to around about the P5 mark. I don't see him getting much further unless there's a bit of chaos. Um, and I don't anticipate there to be too much chaos apart from the heat being an issue and obviously the heat is, is hot in France and that could in, impact in particular the Ferrari engines, it could also impact degradation for everyone but the Red Bulls in particular have been struggling particularly in a uh, couple of weeks ago in Austria we had a lot of tyre degradation with the Red Bulls and they were like struggling to understand what's going on. So are they on top of that? Are the Red Bulls on top of that? But who knows? So there are some factors which could lead Carlos Sainz to improve in from on P5. But if he does finish P5, we've got we've got some great data from Canada here as to what, what would happen. So we had Leclerc start all the way back at the grid. Well, P19 effectively was, wasn't it? He did take part in Q1, I believe, and then sort of just sat out of Q2 onwards from his uh, engine penalty. And he finished in P5. And, you know, you can see here positions gained got the 10 points like I said it's going to happen for Carlos Sainz providing he finishes the race and he came away with 23 points if you are you know 23 points Carlos Sainz is costing 17 million <clears throat> if you come away with 23 points you're not unhappy obviously he's in like the best car or one of the best cars so you kind of want to get him in this category up here where you can see like Verstappen, Sainz, Hamilton in the 40 sort of point region I just don't see it happening for Carlos Sainz but still if he managed to get sort of between 20 maybe up to 25 points I haven't worked out exactly but you can see the rough idea here 23 for example color signs i think then you can be kind of happy with that so you could you could argue that you want color signs and team you could just go back to kind of the template of you know the perez signs where are we um bring in color signs you could end up with a kind of what i would classify as a template build um going with this if you think carlos if you're happy with color signs kind of been having that ceiling of around 20 odd points um you could also, if you've got the budget and you, you think Pierre Gasly is looking good, then we could bring in Pierre Gasly. You could, uh, could have a team like this. I'd be quite happy with a team like this, to be honest. Um, if, you, if you're if you reluctant to pick signs because of what's going on, the penalties and everything, um, I think a great, a great pickup in his place would be Lando Norris. Because if we look at what's going on um, in the practice sessions, both Norris and Gasly here, P5, P7, P6, P7, both of them have shown consistency in the past, in particular Norris, but Gasly, to some extent as well, has shown good consistency um, going from the practice sessions into qualifying and then general race pace. And we, how many times have we seen, in particular Norris and Gasly themselves, in the over the last season and a half or so, where they just have those races where they're just all by themselves, the cameras just basically never pick them up um, because it's just boring and there's no, you know, there's no wheel to wheel because they're just all going around themselves, going around in circles by themselves for like the whole the whole Grand Prix and they're just finishing P5, P6. It's a very boring race in terms of watching um, from a, like a viewer perspective. So like I say, the camera doesn't even really focus on them, but they just quietly go about their business and they end up P5, P6. I can definitely see from either one or both of them this week, I could see we could be seeing Lando Norris and Gasly just a fairly comfortable. Um, a kind of a comfortable race for them. I don't know. It's especially with Perez possibly being out of sorts. Carlos Sainz starting at the back of the grid. Mercedes not quite as fast as we thought they would. And that gives me that gives me reason to believe. You know, you throw in a, a DNF or two, and suddenly Norris and Gasly are going from a quiet race in the P6 region up to P4, P5. Dare we say? So yeah, I do think that Gasly and Norris potentially could be great value. Keep an eye on FP3 on them because you know. We could, I could be looking at a team kind of like this if I if I fancy something like that. Um, that aside, you know, like I say, color signs is still potentially a good option. I could see <coughs> going with a team like this. Um, this obviously drops Max Verstappen. I do think I do. I'm, I'm tempted, like I say, to keep my team as it was. If I just um, undo all and go back to my original team, you can see I'm kind of tempted to keep Verstappen because it looks clear to me with, like I say, with Perez struggling slightly and Carlos signs at the back or at, potentially at the back. It looks clear to me that Verstappen and Leclerc are going to be P1, P2. 
on qualifying and likely to be racing it out for the race win. So the temptation to, first of all, double up on Verstappen, who could be winning the race. And then, you know, you've got Leclerc here as a turbo driver, just sort of maximising as much as I can the people who I think are going to win the race. Then I think this the team like this, this is why, this is why I'm very tempted to just leave it like this, because I think these guys are going to be uh, P1, P2. It does leave you a little bit of filler. The Hazes haven't looked super competitive. Magnussen's done okay. No upgrades again for the Haz. So, yeah, you know, as a support driver, fine. And, you know, six million, you can't really argue. Latifi, he's got those upgrades to match Albon now. He's still P20, P20 um, in the practice sessions, which it's exactly where Latifi likes to be because that's how he scores his, his um, points. Whoops, I just kicked him out of the team by accident. Sorry, mate. Um, but, yeah, you can see, look at his points um, across the season. He's fine as a bit of filler. Not done super well in the last few races, but I do think if he's if he qualifies, you know, P19, P20, there's going to be some DNS most likely with um, reliability issues and that. He'll just like randomly get 10, 10 to 15 points, and that's fine for his kind of budget. So, one other thing I could do is just like get rid of get rid of um, the Tifi for another has driver, and that would enable me to be able to afford Pierre Gasly. But do I really do I really want to have double hazes when you know they just don't look. They just don't look great. I mean, yes, they've done very well in the last couple of races, but so I could I could definitely see myself with a team like this, and I wouldn't fault my future self for picking this team, but I'm not convinced by the double hazards, and I don't know, I don't know. But it is very tempting because, you know, Leclerc and Verstappen probably going to come first and second, providing there's no DNF. So there is a strong temptation for this team. A part of me also has this kind of F1 fantasy fatigue over the last few weeks, apart from where it went well last week in Austria with the Mega Driver. The amount of analysis that goes into it, looking at the practice sessions, trying to predict who's going to do well, and then it just gets blown out like in Silverstone before you even get to turn one and half your team's DNF before you've even like switched the TV on, sort of thing. So part of me just kind of wants to go back to the kind of tried and tested template, um, which is you know the the trio of Leclerc, Perez, Signs, which I've discussed already. Kinda get rid of Schumacher, then we can bring in someone like. Pierre Gasly as an example so I could very much see a race just go I could see myself going with this team if I'm not completely convinced by Carlos Sainz's point potential then I could see myself dropping down to Norris and going with a team like this this is pretty template um yeah if I if I want to just kind of you know because there's so much there's so much to take into account and you can take different risks and you can make a whole there's so many different teams you can make. I kind of want to just almost part of me just want to revert back to this template build. Like I say, it just it looks it looks so nice with all like the double Red Bull, the double Ferrari, Gasly, who I think is just going to do well. You know, he's got a tendency to be consistent and have that nice quiet race where he just goes about P5, P6. Cameras don't pick him up, and you know, he picks up 20, 25 points or whatever. Like, I, there's a strong temptation to go over a team like this. And I'm kind of leaning towards that way as well. Like I'm leaning like very much in so many different directions. I'm going to fall over if I lean over any more sort of thing. But <laughs> Carlos Sainz, like I say, I've already spoken about kind of a ceiling on his points potential. So I do think it's tempting to just bring in Norris instead. So I do like a team like this, definitely. And then you could even afford to upgrade someone like Magnussen to potentially Albon. You could, I could end up with a team like this. But then the more, the more I like tweak it like this, the more I'm, all of, the, all of a sudden moving away from the template but the template <sighs> the template doesn't quite work because of Carlos Sainz this week so this if Carlos Sainz didn't have a grid penalty I think I'd definitely be on this template build but it's a tough one it's a tough one there is one other thing uh, to worth considering is is putting in George Russell just for that reliability issue um doesn't mean it doesn't mean we have to sort of drop out the likes of um Gasly and Norris, and then I'd personally not have the budget to get the Albon, so I'd be reduced back down to like a Latifi or whatever. And I could have a team like this. This team also looks really good, which is why like, basically every team I'm putting on right now just looks really good, which makes it really hard to know what to pick, to be honest. Um, but I'm very happy with a team like this as well. You know, you've got the double up on, you've got Red Verstappen, who's likely to win the race, covered. You're not doubled up on him with my, you know, when I had with the build of Verstappen plus Red Bull, and I do think Verstappen is likely to come first or second, so it makes me tempted to go that way. <clears throat> but at least if I went, you know, can't have all. Oh, this is the problem with fantasy. Everyone wants everyone, basically. There's just a temptation to, you know, oh, I want him, I want him, and you keep chopping and changing your team because, oh, he looks good and he looks good. You can't have everyone, okay? <laughs> There's only six slots in this entire team, so it's, you know, everyone take a chill pill, calm down. Um, <laughs> um, maybe it's just me that needs to calm down. But yeah, um, this team looks good. Russell, 
keep an eye on what happens in FP3. I, I think Mercedes aren't quite as um, fast as I expected them to be, but Russell has just done so well across the season. I've spoken about reliability already, and Mercedes, um, from what I can see, appear to be the most reliable team. Uh, famous last word, double DNF coming right up. But um, no, I do think Russell is just a safe bet. Obviously, you can't turbo drive him, but I think the best turbo driver this weekend is Leclerc anyway. Um, and then you get Perez, who hasn't done super well in the practice sessions, but I, like I said, I anticipate him to improve through FP3 and qualifying and the race pace itself. I think Perez should have a, a fine race. So there's a temptation also to go with a team like this. There's just there's so much to decide, and I haven't made my mind up as yet. <sighs> So, <laughs> Epi Free coming up, and then it's big decision time. Um, I will try and be active on Twitter later because I know it does. It does have a tendency. If you not only have about five hundred f- followers, I think on Twitter at Popman F One. By the way, if you haven't already followed me, I do try and stay active in, in the lead up to the deadline. But forgive me if I can't like answer everyone because it does go a bit crazy. But I will try and like you know I'm going to post my team later on my YouTube community tab, for example. So I know I've talked and f- talked through like two or three different variations of teams I'm looking at at the moment. Like this team looks solid. We can go back to the team like this, and like I say, leave it as that. Leave the Alpine driver in there. Like they, like I said, they haven't looked great, but Alonso's looked okay, and I could just leave it like that. Like there's a huge variety of teams to go for. Is there any right pick at the moment? I don't know. I mean, you could get you could get the super calculator out and just try and do all sorts of calculations, but I don't think it's worth it. But just because of the high variance that we're dealing with, I think we just need to kind of predict who we're gonna who's who's gonna be the most consistent, reliable picks. To be honest, and I just want to go for a kind of a safe a safe team this week. I want a safe team that makes that why I'm kind of leaning towards that template build. I'm also leaning towards the Russell build because he kind of makes me feel safe. George Russell, make, George Russell, the kind of guy that makes you feel safe <laughs> when picking your F1 fantasy team. Um, so yeah, there's all three builds for me, and you know you could even argue with the Ferrari constructor to free up funds for someone like Verstappen and that could then upgrade someone like the Tifi up to, for example, Pierre Gasly. And we could be looking at a team like this. Oh my God, there's a fourth build, everybody. There's a fourth build that I'm going to talk about. <laughs> um, but yeah, gen- genuinely, this team looks kind of good as well. Like. And Carlos Sainz limits Ferrari as a constructor for me personally, which is why I'm kind of leaning much more towards the Red Bull as a constructor. But the front, the funds it frees up, and if Carlos Sainz does get the 20 points, then I don't know. You could end up with a team like this. So basically, this entire video is being me saying I can't make my mind up. There's about four different teams I'm going to pick, and in a couple of hours' time, I'm going to pick one. So, like I say, please let me know your thoughts in the comments because it's a bit of a headache. Do we play it safe this week? I think. Personally, yes, I want to play as safe as possible. So I'm going to go away and just have another think after FP3. I'm going to have a think about obviously who looks who looks good, but also what is the safest team for me personally. I'm not going to be trying to spike points this week. I'm kind of a bit fed up of trying to of spiking here and there and just getting burnt. Um, I want to just go for the safest pick, and then when I click like submit on my substitutions and confirm my team. I can go in with a sense of calm, knowing that whatever happens in qualifying, whatever happens in the race, I'm happy with my decision. And that's what I try and do every single week. There's a couple of race weeks where it's not quite happened and I've come away thinking, oh, I've clicked to submit and I immediately sort of regret my decision. Um, I don't want that. And I think, yeah, if you can like confirm your team and just come away with a sense of, yeah, I'm happy with my decision making, I'm happy with my team whatever happens happens and then it helps you also deal with the emotional trauma of when you get a race like Silverstone and everything goes tits up so <laughs> yeah um let me know what you think let me know what you're thinking in the comments on twitter later yeah let's get a conversation going thanks very much for watching i'm sorry i'm not a bit more clean cut but like i say it's a bit of a, a bit of a head scratcher this weekend so thanks for thanks very much for watching and i'll catch you in the build up for hungary in a few days time thanks very much and um, good luck everybody